Chapter 1 The boy was about 15 years old. He tried to stand very straight and still when he heard the news, but inside of him, everything had gone black. It wasn't that he couldn't endure pain. In summer, he would put a stone hot from the fire on his flesh to see how long he could stand it. In winter, he would sit in the icy river until his Indian father smoking on the bank said he could come out. It made him strong against any hardship that would come to him, his father said. But if it had any effect on this thing that had come to him now, the boy couldn't tell what it was. For days word had been reaching the Indian village that the Lenenalape and Swashnus must give up their white prisoners. Never for a moment did the boy dream that it meant him. Why, he had been one of them ever since he could remember. Quiloga was his father. Eleven years past, he had been adopted to take the place of a son dead from the yellow vomit. More than once, he had been told how, when he was only four years old, his father had said words that took out his white blood and put Indian blood in its place. His white thoughts and meanness had been wiped away and the brave thoughts of the Indian put into their stead. Ever since he had been true son, the blood of Quiloga and flesh of his flesh. For eleven years he had lived here, a native of this village, on the, a full member of the family. Then how could he have been torn from his home like a sampling from the ground and given to the alien whites who were his enemy? The day his father told him, the boy made up his mind. Never would he have given up his Indian life. Never. When no one saw him, he crept away from the village. From an old campfire, he blackened his face. Up above, Pocahontink, which means the stream between two hills, had been found a hollow tree. Now he hid himself in it. He thought only he knew the existence of that tree and was dismayed when his father tracked him t into it. It was humiliating to be taken back with his beckoning hand and tied up by in his father's cabin like some prisoner to be burned at the stake. When his father led him out next morning, he knew everybody watched, his mother and sisters, the townspeople, his uncles, his aunts, his cousins and his favorite cousin Half Arrow, with whom he had ever fished hunt and played. Seldom had they been separated even for a single day. All morning on the path with his father, crazy thoughts ran like squirrels in the boy's head. Never before had he known his father to be in the wrong. Could it be that he was in the right now? Had he unknowingly left a little white blood in the boy's veins, and was it for this that he must be returned? Then they came in sight of the ugly log and pale tents of the white army, and the boy felt sure there was in his body not a drop of blood that knew these things. At the sight and smell of the white man, strong, aversion, and loathing came over him. He tried with all his young strength to get away. His father had to hold him hard. In the end, he dragged him, twisting and yelling over the ground, to the council house of the white and threw him on the leaves that had been spread around. I gave talking paper that I bring him, he told the white guards. Now he belonged to you. It was all over then, the boy knew. He was as good as dead and lay among the other captives with his face down. He was sure that his father had stayed. He could feel his presence and smell the sweet inner bark of the red willow mixed with the dried summich leaves of his pipe. When dusk fell, a white guard came up. The other soldiers called him Dell, perhaps because he talked Delaware, the strange name the whites give the Lenanape and their language. Trusan heard Dell tell his father that all Indians must be out of the camp by nightfall. From the sounds, the boy guessed this his father was knocking out his pipe and putting it away. Then he knew he had risen and was standing over him. Now go like an Indian, true son, he said in a low, stern voice. Give me no more shame. He left almost at once, and the boy heard his footsteps in the leaves. 
the rustling sound grew farther and farther away. When he sat up, his father was gone, but never before or since was the place his father was going back to so clear and beautiful in the boy's mind. He could see the great oaks and shiver bark hickory standing over the village in the autumn dusk, the smoke rising from the double row of cabins with the street beneath and the shining white reflection of the sky in the Trusakaras beyond. Fallen red, brown, and golden leaves lay over roofs and bushes, streets, and forest floors. Tramping through them could be made of the friendly forms of those he knew, warriors and hunters, squaws and the boys, dogs and girls he had played with. Throughout the open door of his father's cabin stone, the warm red fire with his mother and sister over it. For this was the beginning of the month of the first snow, November. Near the fire, heavy bark had been stewn on the ground, and it lay his familiar bed and the old, worn, half-grown beerskin he pulled over himself at night. Homesickness overwhelmed him, and he sat there and wept. After a while, he was conscious of eyes upon him. When he looked up, he saw the white guard they called Dell standing there in the dusk. That, too, the Indian is part of the day and part of the night. The white soldier... The white soldier was about twenty years old, with red hair and a hunting shirt of some coarse brownish cloth. Bosom stuck out like a pouch from his belongings, carrying it in. His belt was tied in the back and his cape fringed with threads that the daylight were revealed scarlet and green. But what afforded the boy was that the white guard laughed at him. Instantly, True Sun turned and lay on his face again. Inside of him, hate rose like poison. Once my hands are loose, I'll get his knife, he promised himself. Think quickly, I'll kill him.